A Cuban immigrant becomes a powerful drug kingpin in Miami. Listen as we chat about popular dorm room posters, fake Churchill quotes, and how an R-rated movie can actually be X-rated. You want to play rough? Say hello to my little friend and find out if Scarface stands the test of time. Test of time, James and Alan have their say. Do the movies you love still hold up today? James says gladiator with a glut. Alan says as a father, blah, blah. It's the test of time, James and Alan have their say. Do the movies you love still hold up today? Test of time, James and Alan have their say. Do the movies you love still hold up today? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Test of Time. My name is Alan Noah, and joining me, as always, is a guy who doesn't have any scars on his face, James Brief. Uh, that is incorrect. I have a small scar above my eyebrow. Uh, I forget which side it's on, actually. So it's one of these. <laughs> oh, I um, think it's your left. It's my left. Um, I got it when I was four or five years old. You know, the bedrooms were on the second floor, so when mom would call you down for dinner, you'd run down the stairs, and we used to like to jump down like the last step or two, and I would jump down like the second step all the way to the bottom, but my brother and sister, they were older, they would jump from the third step, Ooh. so I wanted to jump from the third step, but actually I figured, why jump from the third step when I could be a god and jump from the <laughs> fourth step? So, <laughs> I get my five-year-old self up to the fourth step, but right before I jump, I realize, wait, this is not like the other jumps. This is, uh, I don't think I can just jump with, like feet forward. I leaped forward head first, like I dove, and I <laughs> dove straight into a dresser. Uh, you know, I got my little Schmendrick uh, you know, forehead split open, and oh then, my God. Uh, you know, I needed stitches. And to this day, it's one of my earliest memories. I still remember looking up at the uh, light of the emergency room, the ceiling light, and this man putting a needle towards my eye and just being like, yeah, that was scary. Aww. <laughs> oh, poor little James. So I guess I am James Scarface Brief. But, you know, that's not the S uh, nickname that I go by. It's, of course, Scooter. No, I think you meant Snowball. Nah, scooter. No, Snowball. Fine Scarface. Uh, no. <laughs> um, I might have a tiny little scar on my face, but it's from a far less interesting story. I had a Mose procedure a million years ago, and it's like where the creases in my forehead are, so I don't think you could even see it anymore. Also, I'm older, and so there are more creases in my forehead. I don't think it was ever really much of a scar. But whatever. You are not Scarface. I am not Scarface. Al Pacino is Scarface. And just thinking about this movie, it made me think of college because this poster was on a lot of dorm room walls back when we were in college. And that was, you know, 1997 to 2001. So a considerable amount of time after this movie came out. But... This was like one of the big three, I think, right? It was this, and you had the Frank Sinatra mugshot, which I never really understood why anyone had it on their dorm wall, and the Pink Floyd albums on the Naked Ladies' backs. Those were like the three that I remember seeing on the most walls. No? You disagree? No, no, th those those are big ones. I'm sure I could probably think of a few others that were big, but uh, Scarface is one of those films that is... Uh, it's way over, I'm not going to say overrated in pop culture, but it is, I'd say, way overrepresented in pop culture compared to certainly its box office take from, from the 80s. And it definitely had, uh, I don't know when it was, maybe the late 90s or around the time we went to college, uh, the early 2000s, and DVDs coming out maybe. Uh, the 20th anniversary, was it, it was re-released, and that was quite successful. I found some crazy uh, statistics about... Uh, the VHS, uh, DVD, Blu-ray sales. I mean, this film made so much money after its box office. So, you know, it generated buzz later. It's so much in, in pop culture that 
I was just surprised because to me it was on the level of Godfather and Goodfellas of it's not really a mob film but just of that kind of criminal film that, that sure. people watch and you know I was surprised to find out that unlike Goodfellas and Godfather it really had mixed reviews as well and uh, you know also like Godfather and Goodfellas it's nearly three hours so yeah. it is a long film but it's its presence in like hip hop culture oh, yeah. uh, is very big. Uh, Huge. I don't know if, you ever, if you've seen, uh, if you're a fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm, I am not. Um, well, there's this uh, there's this one uh, rapper in universe there, and he's giving Larry a tour of his mansion, and he's like, "Yeah, this room here, he's gonna have televisions on." every wall and all across the ceiling and all across the floor and he says it's gonna play Scarface 24-7 I think mostly because of uh you know say hello to my little friend and he's real badass and the world is mine and the only character I've seen kind of a little bit like him but not as uh, revered as him because he was real and a real piece of shit was um uh, the guy from Narcos um okay uh, uh Pablo Escobar. Escobar, there you go. Because he was this ruthless guy, but, you know, had charm and charisma to him. But also there was this overlying, like, no, he murdered, like, civilians. Tony, I I was actually surprised watching this. He has a very weird, like so many criminals have, but he has a very, very strict set of morals and ethic codes. Yeah. And, you know, he won't kill women and kids. And he says something to one of the guys. He said, I never screwed over anyone in my life that didn't have it coming. Right. And that's not true. He definitely (laughs) screws over his best friend and second-hand guy at the end for no good reason. Well, it was maybe true when he said it. Correct, correct. We assume he said it. But um, this film, it's just shocking to me how big it is in pop culture just compared to how many times I'd seen it. This is probably the second time I've seen it in its entirety. I'm very, very confident that the same is true for me. And I do think that the prevalence of this movie in hip hop, I think, definitely made it more popular because if you have a movie that some rapper references once, okay, maybe you're not going to go and see that movie because who cares? But Nas and Chief Keef and Future and Tupac were were singing about Scarface. Drake had a song this year, 2023. Like, it is still very prevalent. And then when you hear all these rappers singing about this movie, you're like, all right, I, I need to check this out. Because apparently it's very cool. If all of these cool people think it's cool, it's probably cool. Well, in case uh, people haven't seen this film in a while, this film is about Tony Montana, played by Al Pacino, who emigrates from Cuba to Miami. There, he meets Omar Suarez, who sends Tony to buy cocaine from some Colombians. The deal goes bad, but Tony and his friend Manny escape with the drugs. They bring them to the local kingpin, Frank Lopez, who takes a shine to Tony. But when Tony makes a major deal behind Frank's back and starts hitting on Frank's girl, Elvira, Frank tries to have Tony killed. Tony survives the assassination attempt, kills Frank, and marries Elvira. But Tony becomes paranoid and isolated, doing more and more coke himself. He drives away Elvira, Manny, and his younger sister, Gina. Inevitably, it all comes crashing down, and Tony goes down in a hail of bullets. Right. Okay, so this movie is beloved and revered now after its release, but how did it do when it first came out 40 years ago? Um, It was from Brian De Palma, so he was already a famous director, and uh, it got really wildly mixed reviews. Uh, The uh, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, very, very mixed reviews to bad reviews. Uh, Ebert gave it four stars. Right. And I've seen the budget anywhere from mid-20s to mid-30 million dollars. When it came out on December 9th, 1983, uh, it it opened at number two with 4.5 million dollars. And number one was a film called Sudden Impact. Have you ever heard of that film? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think it was the second largest franchise still going at that time. I mean, I'm sure in the 30s and stuff, they had all those Tarzan films. But at the time, I think only the Bond franchise was going. And this was the fourth of five in a very, very famous uh, uh, movie series that I have never seen. But I have seen two of the most famous scenes. And all you have to do is watch them on YouTube. And they're so cool. Uh, Death Wish? 
You're very, very close. Okay. Very close. Not Death Wish. What would be the equivalent of Charles Bronson's Death Wish at that time? I don't know, you man. You can guess it. All right, all right. So the most famous, there's two most famous scenes. Uh, this guy's a cop. And he shoots, he has a six shooter. And he, bam, bam, bam. And the, uh, oh, Dirty Harry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bad guy's down on the ground. And he's about to reach for his gun. But Dirty Harry uh, points his revolver and goes, I know what you're thinking. Did I shoot five bullets or six? Well, do you feel lucky, punk? Do ya? And then the guy decides not to go for his gun because Dirty Harry is so tough. Once he has him, uh, you know, kicks the gun away, he shoots in the air and realizes he did shoot six times. There was no bullets in the gun. Uh, it's a great scene. I recommend, uh, I recommend you watch it. But this film, uh, like I said, opened at number two with $4.5 million. It had a very uh, long staying power because it ended up with $44 million. So um, ten times its uh, opening weekend. Wow. Interestingly, number four that weekend that opened uh, was about a killer car. And I believe we are going to review this film at some point. Christine? Yes, Christine. I'd be down for that. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that at some point. Sure. Um, but this film, oh my God, $44 million. So, you know, it made a little pass budget you know, this is one of those dvds that i didn't own but so many people owned with like the matrix and uh, austin powers you had that and scarface and this film sold 3.7 million dvd units which took in 78 million dollars in 2003 wow and it sold uh 285,000 blu-ray units for six million dollars there that's an insane amount of money for a movie that came out 25 years later, uh, 25 years earlier, and that's just free money. And, you know, how much does it cost to stamp a DVD? Probably pennies. Probably the case costs more than the, uh, than the actual disc. I feel like I read somewhere that the DVD and Blu-ray were, like, bad. Like, the, the transfers were bad and people were pissed off. Maybe I'm getting that mixed up with another movie. I'm not sure about that. It's possible because I know there's been several versions of Scarface that have come out. So maybe they've fixed it at some point. Okay. This was a film that was both nominated for three Golden Globe Awards for Best Actor for Al Pacino, Best Supporting Actor of Stephen Bauer, and Best Original Score. And it was also nominated for a Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Director. And when you say Worst Director, you can sometimes have a bad actor or actress in a film that's otherwise fine. But just, you know, when you say the Worst Director, you're kind of shitting on the film. Oh, definitely. And so it's just, it's wild to me that it's really gotten such a 180. Yeah. I mean, I can see why critics didn't like this movie. Like, the, the way the movie starts is with these immigrants coming in from Cuba and the insinuation is that a lot of these people were criminals and from a test of time perspective that kind of does stand the test of time in that Americans sometimes look at immigrants and point their finger and say these are all bad people they are criminals cough cough former president trump that sentiment still exists and reading about uh this particular emigration from cuba i didn't know about this it happened when we were three years old but in the media there were claims that of the hundred seventy five thousand people who showed up from cuba thousands and thousands and thousands of them were criminals and that really wasn't true you know maybe like a couple dozen or so were violent criminals you know the percentage really wasn't that fucking high but maybe according to some other accounts there were a lot of criminals there but only because they were coming from Cuba so if these people ever attended a fucking protest saying that they didn't like Fidel Castro then they were thrown in jail so technically they were criminals but they weren't violent they weren't going to do anything here they wanted to come to America for a better life. And apparently, I read this today. I didn't see it when I watched the movie the other day. But apparently at the very, very end of the credits, there is like a caveat or something where it says, not all Cuban immigrants are criminals. In fact, many of them are wonderful, upstanding citizens. I, I, I should have fact checked it. I should have put the movie on uh, and just fast forwarded. And I, I didn't have time to do that. But I mean, on the one hand, neat that's cool great sentiment on the other hand you put that at the very end of the credits of your three-hour movie who the fuck stayed in the theater to watch that 
I mean, the answer is it's in the middle of those two. You know, when someone says they're sending out oh, rapists uh, from other countries, like that's obviously a lie. And when someone says that 150,000 immigrants that come are all like starving uh, political prisoners, that that's of course a lie. You have 100,000 people, there's going to be shitheads in 100,000 people. And there's going to be murderers and rapists. It's not because they're Cuban. It's because they're humans. And, you know, of course there's going to be Tony Montana's there. We're going to, you know, no problem killing. And uh, I didn't think that that opening uh, scroll was necessary. I thought you could have just had him be a Cuban immigrant. And then, like, oh, hey, we are able to get out of this detention center by doing a job for some guy. We didn't need the backstory that uh, they sent 150,000 and most of them were uh, criminals. Or at least 25 thousand of them were if he was just a regular immigrant why is he in a detention center with all these other cubans i i think you do kind of need that historical context i think it does help i, I mean there's certain things like the reason that he's there is because they figure he's lying because he has like a prison tattoo on his arm so or on his hand he could have done it another way i just i was waiting for some kind of payoff they do refer to it a few times like michelle pfeiffer's character is like oh you stupid cuban uh, you're all just criminals anyway or you're something fresh like off that. the banana boat yeah fresh off the banana boat so i think it paints a picture of what uh, people were saying. And I'm not saying they shouldn't have put it there because it's, again, mean to Cubans. I think they could have said that thing that they were trying to say, like, there's a lot of criminals coming here. I just think it was an unnecessary thing that was uh, not relevant to the plot. I get what you're saying. Also, just from a behind-the-scenes perspective, there was talk about remaking the old original Scarface from the 30s and Brian De Palma was kind of in on it and Oliver Stone wrote the script and no one could really kind of figure out how to do it because, you know, the the original movie is about prohibition and uh, Italian-American gangsters and that kind of felt like well-worn territory in 1983, still kind of does. But so I, I forget who it was, but someone had the idea of, well, what if we made it about a Cuban immigrant and it's about cocaine because cocaine is the modern prohibition it is you know prohibited and so there is you know this underground element to bringing it in and then that was like the light bulb aha moment of okay that's how we remake scarface so that was sort of just their way in and that that brought everyone in everyone was uh, on board and apparently oliver stone when he got this job was himself addicted to cocaine and he was trying to write the script and he couldn't do it because of his drug addiction. And then he went to France and quit cold Turkey, got sober and then wrote the script and was happy with it. So um, I guess it was a good thing for Oliver Stone. It got him clean. Good for him. Uh, you know, while it's kind of a quote unquote modern setting for when the film was taken, I just think they made such a smart choice in updating it to this because I think they got lucky in the fact that this is what it turned out to be. But when you think of certain decades, you just think about one specific thing about the decades. I, again, I'm oversimplifying, but the 70s, you think of disco and you're thinking of like New York City Studio 54. When you're thinking of the 80s, I mean, cocaine Miami 80s is just... That's a character right there. Uh, Grand Theft Auto famously had one of its uh, games take place in the 80s, and it's called Vice City. It's all about just that, that Miami Vice of those ridiculous blue and pink, and all these characters in this film are wearing them. These guys were making a quote-unquote modern film, and they were making all those guys dress in what we would call you know, Miami Vice outfits. And they lucked out that this would be such a cool thing, like, like making Seattle grunge in the 90s. It's just such an iconic era, and... It just works so well because, you know, there's so many films like this in about the drug trade. Uh, you got Johnny Depp's Blow. It's kind of the same formula where you kind of start from the bottom. There's always a montage where everything's going great and the world is yours. And then, you know, it all goes to shit. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that you bring up that montage. I felt like that montage specifically was... A bummer. Not that the montage itself is bad, but all of that that you see in that, I don't know, three minute sequence 
that could have been stretched out. Like I, I kind of wanted to see more of that. And I did feel like this movie was paced wrong. It really takes its time with certain scenes and certain beats. And it really just lets you live in these moments. And that's fine. That's totally fine. But then it really hits the gas and blows past some of these important things like um, Tony's rise after he kills Frank and then he marries Elvira and everything. It's just a montage. Like, wait, wait, wait. I want to see how this happens. I want to see his rise. And I couldn't help but think that that would have been a season of TV. If this was a TV show streaming on Prime or Max or something, Tony's rise, that would have been season two, say, you know? And it's just three minutes with the cheesiest fucking song ever playing in the background. And I was like, this is a bummer. I just want there to be so much more. Famously, uh, South Park, and uh, they put it in their movie Team America, colon, World Police. They gave the instructions on a montage, on a good montage. And that it basically says, show a little bit of improvement over and over, you know, advance the story a little bit uh, so you can show like, you know, months and months in, in a couple of minutes. I felt like the montage didn't go anywhere. It was just counting money and bringing bags into the bank. Yeah, at the end there were more bags, but I felt like these montages are usually like, oh, he's going to like break into one of the rivals and kill all of them. Then he's going to break into another rival, kill all of them. You're going to see a map and his area is going to get larger and larger and larger. I agree with what you were saying. I, I didn't know what was bothering me about that montage, but it wasn't as fun as I wanted it to be because... Yeah, it, it should have been a little bit uh, more advancing the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm saying this as a, as a guy who lives in the suburbs, but it's like people who drive really fucking fast from stop sign to stop sign when they're driving around like a neighborhood and then they get on the, the parkway and then just drive 40 miles an hour. It's like, no, no, no. Drive slower in the neighborhood and then drive faster on the parkway. Like you're kind of doing it wrong. Like it's just, backwards and I realize that I'm just like a dumbass podcaster who's like wagging my finger at Scarface one of the most beloved movies ever and I don't know maybe people are gonna add us on Twitter or whatever for me saying that but like usually a montage doesn't really bother me but this montage kind of bothered me because I was like oh there's so much more here in a movie that's three hours I figured like yeah, the montage should show us, like, definitely make it so that it doesn't have to be three and a half hours. Show us, like, 40 minutes of film. And you make a very good point. There's almost, like, a season of of a TV show that you can make called, like, Scarface, Rise to Power, uh, you know, something yeah. like that. Well, it didn't bother me as much as it did with you. Fair. But let me ask you, having seen this film exactly once, like me, and years ago, I assume? Yeah, probably. What did you remember from this film? Because I remembered exactly three things from the film. All right, let's see. Um, I remember the big shootout at the end. Same as me. That was one of them. I remember the chainsaw scene. Same as me. Yeah. Um, was there a third thing that I remembered too? Um, it's not a specific scene. I had, had never seen her except for really like Batman Returns, but okay. Michelle Pfeiffer being unbelievably beautiful. I do also think of the... Lonely Island song, Jack Sparrow, where Michael Bolton is singing about Pirates of the Caribbean for most of the song. And then at the very end, he like gets into Scarface. So I kind of remembered some of the movie from that song, which I've listened to a lot of times as a big fan of the Lonely Island. But yeah, I didn't really remember much. In my memory, the chainsaw scene was far more graphic and you saw the limbs being severed and then watching it the other day it's like oh no of course not it's not that graphic and you know I guess they could have done decent work with practical effects but doing research about the movie one of the reasons why you don't see everything super graphically is because of the rating and this movie was originally slapped with an X rating because of the violence and then De Palma made some cuts and it was still going to be an X and he made some more cuts and it was still going to be an X and then all of these people like lobbied the MPAA. You got to change it. This is an important movie. It shows the evils of drug use. Some people who criticized the movie and gave this movie bad reviews thought that it was glorifying violence and glorifying 
not even just drug use, but like drug dealing and this criminal element. But there were a lot of other people who said, no, no, it shows you the shitty side of being addicted to drugs and being a drug dealer and all that stuff. So they lobbied the MPAA to give it an R rating. And then Brian De Palma just released the original version anyway and figured no one would notice. And apparently no one did. So it was, a, uh, I guess, technically an X rated movie that got an R rating. He just snuck it through. That's funny. Um, you touched on something interesting that I agree with those critics, actually. I think Tony Montana, at least today, is very much uh, revered. Not not just the movie, but he's revered. Yeah, by all those rappers and everyone. They love him. Exactly. And you were asking before, how come that Frank Sinatra poster is so popular? And I think the reason it's so popular is because, yeah, I don't remember what he did, but uh, I have it's, no idea. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty badass that he was a criminal. Why was 50 Cent famous? Because he was shot half a dozen times and survived. I mean, it's that criminal element. I mean, Tony Soprano, I mean, they're not anti-heroes because Tony Montana is no hero. He's not even an anti-hero. He's, he's uh, the protagonist, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it is interesting to look at it from a test of time lens where we sort of look at these things a little bit more critically now, or at least I do. And, you know, a lot of the critics I read talk about things in this way where what's the line between a hero and an anti-hero and a protagonist and someone who shows the audience the evils and the dangers of doing this thing, but also kind of make it look pretty fucking cool. And, you know, I think that definitely can be said about Tony Montana. Yeah, he dies. He dies terribly, but also it's pretty cool, right? That's how I want to go, getting shot down in a blaze of glory, to paraphrase John Bon Jovi. Like, that is kind of what you want. If you consider yourself a gangsta, if you consider yourself a badass, that's what's going to happen. And I think it is fair to say that this movie, while yes, it does show you cocaine is bad, this is what happens when you do cocaine, nothing good, it also does glorify it. It glorifies the drug use. It glorifies the lifestyle. He has the beautiful mansion. He has the beautiful wife. Everything that he ever said he wanted, he gets. So it's very easy to look at it and say, yes, this movie tells you that drugs are bad. Or it's very easy to look at it and say, yeah, this is what I want. You know, I I don't really think it says that cocaine's that bad. Uh, Yeah, Tony gets paranoid. And I guess you can read between the lines is the coke that's doing it. Or was he always kind of a hothead? But this is not one of those requiem for a dream that shows you how awful drugs can be. I remember there was a film, American Gangster, with uh, Denzel Washington and uh, and Russell Crowe. And it's all about kind of this guy that's the king of uh, New York cocaine or crack or whatever it was. And there's a scene that that Ridley Scott, the director, made sure to put in there that was like, yeah, we're going to leave the uh, mansion with the ivory piano for a moment. And let's show you what this what these drugs are actually doing. And it shows like a building in Harlem and like a baby's crying while the mom is asleep or dead with a needle in her arm on the bed. That stuff to remind you like, yeah, these guys are billionaires and it's really fucking awesome how they're living because there's so many orphans out there and right. scores of dead young people and old people and parents grieving and kids grieving. So I don't think this film does that. I feel like the bigger villain in this film is communism because they talk a lot about communism being so evil and and Tony was so happy to kill a communist in the beginning. He's like, that one, I did that for free or I did that for fun. It's interesting to me that you say that communism is a villain because communism is what Tony Montana hates in the beginning of the movie. But then later in the movie, he's railing against capitalism. All he wanted in the beginning is to get away from communist Cuba and come to America because of the American dream. Here you can make something of yourself. Here you can build up your wealth because of capitalism. And he does until he realizes that in capitalism, you get fucked too. What is it? I think they say it about uh, democracy, that it's the worst solution unless you look at all the other ones or or something like that. Yeah, I think Churchill, and this might be one of these fake Churchill quotes, but uh, he says democracy is the worst uh, form of government except for all the other ones. Right, 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 right. And so I think that's sort of like what... 
this movie is kind of saying about capitalism and kind of communism. It, it's basically saying that in either you're going to get fucked. No matter how big and powerful you are, someone else is going to be more rich, more powerful, and they're going to take your money and you're going to be fucking pissed about it. Yeah, Tony is paranoid. Yes, he's greedy. Yes, he has all of those flaws. But there is also something to be said about, yeah, he thought communism was the worst thing in the world until he met capitalism. That is not a coincidence. That is definitely very deliberate that was written into this movie by Oliver Stone. And I like it. I appreciate that because, you know, this movie comes out in 83, the height of the Cold War. I mean, I guess the the height of the Red Scare was in the 50s and McCarthy and all that. But in the 80s, too, people hated those damn commies. And it's easy to, to point your finger and say that system is awful. But, you know, for a guy who's lived through both, they were both awful. Maybe socialism is the answer there? Split the difference? I guess? Question mark? Al, are you trying to figure out what the ideal form of government is on the spot? Um, no, I think I think socialism seems to be like the better alternative. But whatever, we'll, we'll talk about that another time. I just liked it. I liked what this movie was saying about the economics of all of it. Also, yes, Tony is super greedy and and that scene where they're counting the money and, you know, the one guy has a count that's just like a couple of thousand dollars off from what Tony has. And you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars where to me, a, a couple of thousand dollars is a big deal. But for them, it's a drop in the fucking bucket. And he's like, well, I guess we could count it again. This is a big deal to me. It's like, dude, get the fuck off of it. But then, of course, the whole thing is a is a sting. And again, with my whole thing about a season of TV, money laundering, that's how he gets busted. Having watched four seasons of Ozark, I feel like there's a lot you can do with money laundering and make it interesting, you know, like make it a compelling drama. And in this movie, it's just kind of one scene where it's like, haha, that's how the government gets you. That's how they got Al Capone on tax evasion. You know, that's going to just be the detail that'll fuck you over. You know, there's some lines in this film that are just so classic. Uh, uh, at the very end, uh, when he holds his gun, say hello to my little friend. Everyone uh, quotes this line. Um, the other one that I love, it's its not as quoted, but its I think it's only because it was spoofed on The Simpsons, and I can't help but laugh, uh, especially when he does it. But it's the line where uh, Tony's explaining to Manny, he goes, in America, first you get the money, then you'll get power, and then the women will come. Uh, Another one that you didn't mention is don't get high on your own supply. That's from this movie too. And I don't know if this is boring behind the scenes shit, but for the beginning of the episode, which we haven't recorded yet, I wrote three intros. One about uh, say hello to my little friend, one don't get high on your own supply, and another one about when you get the the money, then you get the power. I don't know which one we're going to pick yet because I feel like any of those would be fun intros for this episode. Yeah, this movie is very, very quotable. Also very easy to sample uh, if you're a rapper and you just want to pull one line of dialogue here. Uh, there's a line in here that reminds me, and this movie came first, but it reminds me of that great line in the classic scene from A Few Good Men. You know, the famous line is, you can't handle the truth. But earlier in that speech, he's talking about, you're damn right I'm on that wall while you pansies are at your cocktail hours. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. But in Scarface, there's a part where Elvira, she uh, she calls Tony, you're a murderer and a drug dealer in the middle of a restaurant and throws water on him and makes a big scene. You'd think he'd be humiliated, but he turns to all of them and goes, you know, fuck all of you. You need me. You need a bad guy in, in your uh, in your life so that you could point to me and say that I'm the bad guy and you're the good people. It is an interesting take that he's that he says, like, people do need uh, an evil guy to hate. Right. But then Tony is pretty fucking evil. The way he treats Elvira is awful and just shitty. And while I agree with you that Michelle Pfeiffer is beautiful, just a thing we've talked about in other podcast episodes and other movies, 
the character of Elvira has no story arc. It's a flat line, you know, in the beginning of the movie, she's a cokehead and she's just arm candy for Frank. And then later on in the movie, she's a cokehead who's just arm candy for Tony. I guess you could say, well, then she does leave Tony. So that's her arc. She has enough self-respect to just walk away. But where is that story? Like, he is so in love with her. He's so infatuated with her. And then on a dime, he's just screaming at her and yelling at her and belittling her. Like, where did that relationship go south. I can put the pieces together in my mind of how it went south. He got this rise to power and then he felt like, you know, she wasn't enough for him and he became paranoid and blah, 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 blah. But we don't see that. You don't see any of that in the movie. It's just like love, infatuation, then hate. Um, I I agree with what you're saying about what happens to her, although I disagree that she doesn't have a great storyline and that I think her storyline is flat. Yes, she leaves Tony, but I don't think she has like a come to Jesus moment. Right. I think she went from Frank to Tony and I think she's going to the next one. She is a complete coke addict. Right. Her heart will explode by the time she's 40 probably because of the amount of coke. She is doing nonstop coke. Yeah. And I like her character in that she tells both Frank and Tony like fuck you to both of you. They're not good men to her. Sure. You know, Tony doesn't treat her well even though he's quote unquote in love with her right you know, even at their wedding he's kind of not happy or anything she's sad i, I find her character sad sure. but i i uh i think the best female character in the film is definitely gina yeah who's uh first she's like oh tony and my long lost brother and he's strangely overprotective of her simply because she's a little sister you know it's obvious that manny was into her of course, he, he uh, murders Manny when uh, he finds out he's sleeping with his sister, but he doesn't know that they had gotten married in secret the day before. Right. So, oops, that's a that's a bummer. You're definitely right about him being super overprotective. Then at the end of the movie, when she kind of walks into his room and is like, well, I guess you just want to fuck me because I can't be with anyone else. It's like, well, that's pretty fucking dark and twisted and fucked up. But also, she's got a point. In that first scene, when they are reunited, he says to her, you need to live your life. You need to get out there and have fun. This is Miami. Go live your life. Then the next time he sees her, she's doing what he said. She is at a club. She is dancing. She is smiling. She has taken his advice to the letter, and he beats the shit out of the guy that she was with because overprotective big brother which okay fine you don't want to see your little sister grinding on a dance floor fine but you know his reaction is awful and then uh he kills manny that kind of made me think of the sopranos uh which you mentioned earlier final season of that show spoiler alert for something that's 15 plus years old when tony kills christopher that's like the shittiest thing that he could do. And he's done lots and lots and lots of shitty things. But that was like his best friend. Tony was like a mentor to Christopher, just like Tony Montana was to Manny. And then to just fucking kill him for kind of no reason. It's just like as low as you could possibly sink. I think Tony killing Christopher This one was totally different. Manny did nothing. Manny was 100% loyal to Tony. I guess he didn't tell him he was, like, seeing his sister. But that's that's not being disloyal to him. But to Tony Montana, it is. I guess. Yeah, you're right. I guess it is. And not for nothing, I definitely don't think he deserved to die for it. Because it's not that bad of a sin. But Tony Montana in this movie is joyless. He does not crack a fucking smile. And Manny calls him out on it. He says, you know, you got to loosen up and enjoy life a little bit. Stop being so fucking paranoid. This is not a person you surprise. Don't fucking surprise Tony Montana. It will not go well. And again, I'm not saying that means that Manny deserved to die. He definitely 100% did not. But yeah, he should have been a little fucking smarter about it. I mean, in general, if you date the boss's daughter, it's probably, it, it, you should probably just mention to your boss. Once you realize it's real, and also to even tell him, by the way, boss, we got married yesterday and you didn't get to see your daughter married. Sister. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right, right. Manny, uh, by the way, is played by Stephen Bauer, who is great in this movie. And I don't know a ton of other things that he's done, except that he was Don Eladio from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. There's another character who is also in those shows. Did you recognize him? 
No. Honestly, I didn't recognize that um, that Stephen Bauer was Don Eladio. I did have to look that up. But I did recognize the assassin, the guy who's going to kill the wife and kid, uh, and then Tony Montana shoots him. I believe his character is called The Shadow. Yeah, he was familiar. Yes. The actor's name is Mark Margolis. Oh, he's the old man in Breaking Bad with a bell. Yes, he is Don Hector. Uh, And I did recognize him. I was like, he looks like Don Hector, except, you know, younger. And then I looked it up, and he is, in fact, Don Hector, the old man with the bell. And um, shows like Sopranos, they, they pulled a couple people from Goodfellas and Godfather. And I think Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul did that as well. I don't know that it was an accident that they picked this guy from uh, Scarface. But um, I felt like I, I had to call that out. But James, let me ask you about this movie as a whole. Do you think that Scarface stands the test of time? Um you know, I will say first, the film is long. I, yes. That is probably why I haven't seen this film uh, more than once. While, yes, you could get, you could cut out probably most of the first 20 minutes and you, you could change a lot of the middle part. I think the uh, the time he spends as Frank's underling probably goes on a little longer than it has to. But I, I think it's a very well-made film. Tony Montana is a very intriguing character. I do like the arc. It's a fun story. The film is violent as hell. Yeah. Um, well, you know, is it really more violent than Goodfellas? It would not have been controversial for its violence today. I really don't think so. Compared yeah. to what we've seen on, on other stuff. Um, so I think it's a fun film. Uh, everyone does a good job in it. And I like that most of the actors are actually kind of unknown. Because then, yeah, you're watching Michelle Pfeiffer and... Uh, Al Pacino, but everyone else you won't necessarily recognize. Yeah, maybe the guy from uh, Breaking Bad, but it's just one of these well-made films. And Brian De Palma, great director. And, you know, he's had some hit and misses, but uh, overall, I like this one. I've only seen this film twice, but I've seen that last scene many times. I think I've seen it on like YouTube. It's just a fun scene to watch. It's also like the clip you'll see in other movies. Like they're watching that scene yeah. of the assassin uh, creeping in the uh, the place at the end. And overall, it's just really fun. So I think it's uh, it does stand the test of time. Uh, what do you think, Al? 1983's Scarface does it stand the test of time? Yes, I think this is an easy one. Yes, it definitely does. Because of its legacy, because everyone is still talking about it 40 years later, it is so quotable, it is so well-known, it is so permeated the zeitgeist. Of course it stands the test of time. When you were talking about like the, the rest of the cast being kind of unknowns, I do think we have to give a shout out to Mary Elizabeth Mastri Antonio, uh, who's had a, a good career. Robert Loja, who plays uh, Frank Lopez, who I will see and always just think of him jumping on the piano with Tom Hanks and Big. I can't help it. And also, we were just talking about F. Murray Abraham a couple weeks ago when we were talking about surviving the game. Here he is again. Here's more right. F. Murray Abraham. And what else have we seen Mary Elizabeth Mastri Antonio? Oh, shit. I know this because I looked it up. Ah, fuck. What was it? Um, It's a Morgan Freeman film. Right. Robin Hood colon uh, Prince of Thieves. Yes. Not Men in Tights. I wanted to say colon Men in Tights, but I knew that was wrong. Yes. She was Maid Marian in that movie. But um, the main thing that I was thinking while watching this movie is that, and I think I've said this before, maybe when we talked about the Godfather movies, I just don't love crime movies. It's just not my genre. I've seen Goodfellas a million times, mainly because my dad and sister loved it, but they're just not like the kind of movie that I gravitate towards. But it's weird. I do gravitate towards crime shows, like the ones we've mentioned many times. The Sopranos, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, uh, Ozark. I fucking love those shows. I really, really do. And I was trying to like think about that. I I was thinking about why that is. And I think the reason is, is that I'm a sucker for a good character study, a good deep dive. That was like one of the big appeals of The Sopranos was that here's a mob guy who's like 
talking to a therapist. That's weird. I mean, there was analyze this, but that was a comedy. This is going to be like an exploration of this guy's psyche. I think the tagline for season one of The Sopranos, if I'm remembering right, and I might not be, was if one family doesn't kill him, the other one will, because there's the mafia family and then his wife and kids. And like, that's that's great. I want to know that. I want to learn about what makes this guy tick. How does it work being a mob boss? What does that do to his wife and his children and his mom? That's interesting to me. And I want to see that play out over several seasons of television. And it's been said so many fucking times, peak TV, we live in golden era of television, prestige dramas, and all of those phrases have lost their meaning. Kind of. But also it's kind of true. And I'm just a sucker for that, that version of analyzing these characters. Give me four seasons showing how a money launderer descent into the crime world. I'm in. I am all in for that show. And I'm not speaking for everyone. I know there are plenty of people who like crime movies and don't want to watch, you know, multiple seasons of multiple hours of these things. And they would rather just watch even a three hour movie. You're right. This movie is long. It's still a hell of a lot less than four seasons of, you know, 10 episodes, 10 hours each. That, that's a bigger time commitment. I can see why some people would like the movie version of it. I'm going to gravitate more towards the TV version. And I think this story, Tony Montana, would make a phenomenal three, four season prestige drama. I think you could very easily show his rise, you know, his fall. I think that would be gripping television. But yes, of course, still, this movie does still stand the test of time for all of the reasons we talked about. It's just a a staple of pop culture. It's kind of crazy that it took us this long on the podcast to get to this movie. But yeah, of course, it stands the test of time. But that's going to do it for us this week. Next week, James, we've got another movie that's pretty fucking long. Actually, the next one is over three hours. Schindler's List is celebrating its 30th anniversary and a movie about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust and the horrible things that happened to Jewish people feels pretty fucking timely right now. So I'm going to say we should buckle in for another three hour movie and watch Schindler's List. All right, but I will say that after Schindler's List, we are doing something really fun because Schindler's List is not going to be a fun film to watch. But after that, oh boy, oh boy, I am excited for these next films. You want to tell them? No, 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 no. Let's make them wait. We'll keep them in suspense. Okay, I'll give you a hint, and this is a controversial hint. Okay. We are doing this film in December. For Christmas. That is a controversial take on this film. I mean, I think you pretty much just told them what it was, but that's fine. Whatever. In the meantime, guys, we want to hear from you. Tell us what you think about Scarface. Are we wrong about Scarface? Am, am I wrong about Scarface? Would this make a terrible TV show? Let us know your thoughts. We are at Test of Time Pod on Facebook, X, Instagram, and Threads. We love hearing from you. Make sure you're subscribed on whatever podcast provider you're listening to us on. And we will see you next time, everybody. Bye.